Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for Wildscreen's third webinar of Emerging Talent Month 2023. My name is Pauline Chalo. I'm an environmental scientist and filmmaker, and uh, I currently work as a producer um, at Wildlife Direct here in Nairobi, Kenya. And I am very, very excited to be chatting with these three superstars, and we're going to get into um, their journeys and everything about them in a bit. So <clears throat> the Wild Queen Emerging Talent program seeks to provide an insight into the natural history film and TV industry and unpack um, the details of the roles available. It also provides information about how you as emerging talent can get to, you know, get your foot in the door and progress in your natural world storytelling um, career. Today, we're going to be discussing breaking into the international natural film and history TV um, from Africa. And there will be a short Q&A at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to pop any question you have at any point in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, to discuss their personal experiences and challenges of breaking into the international natural history film and TV and give us insight into the different routes into the industry, we're joined by Weekly Fodera, professional FDASA and KPSDA, assessed nature guide and specialist filming driver, Trishala Naidu, wildlife presenter, conservationist and educator, and um, Manu Akatsa, who is a cinematographer and a producer. Thank you all uh, for joining and let's get into it. Hello, hello, Trishala, Manu, we could. Hi, Pauline, thank you so much for that wonderful hello. and warm welcome. Amazing, um, we'll just get right into the questions and um, we're gonna start all at the same page. So, Please, each one of you, could you please tell us a bit more about yourselves and your role within the natural history um, industry? Let's start with you. Um, I'm going to go in form of who's fast on my screen, so Trishala. Gosh, when people do that, it always gives me anxiety because, you know, it's always different for each person. <laughs> yeah. I should have given this a bit like one, two, three. <laughs> Anyway, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you for joining us in the chats. We kind of see all of you coming through. It's really exciting to be here um, and it's also really exciting to be able to talk to people who want to do what we do, or even just a facet of what we do, because it, it is quite a journey and it's different for everybody and goals change, change and the journey changes and steps change and all of that. And um, this kind of resource is so valuable. So thank you for joining us and thank you Wildscreen for having me on board. So a little bit about me, um, I'm a wildlife television presenter and I work for a couple different production companies doing pretty much the same thing because the foundation is in the biology and uh, the guiding. So much like Wetcliffe, I'm also a guide, I'm a Fagasa qualified guide. Um, and so that kind of ties in with my background, which is in environmental science, like you, Pauline, uh, and biology. So I kind of merged all of those two, to, or all of those three together, and then ended up on the doorstep of wildlife filmmaking. Uh, and so currently I work for Africam, which is a company here in South Africa that has different cameras around Southern Africa for now, or East Africa as well, as well in Aldonio. Um, and I do narrations for them, I uh, present for them, I sometimes even do script work, things like that for them. And then I also work for Wild Earth where I'm an on-screen presenter. So that's me in a nutshell in terms of uh, wildlife filmmaking. Awesome, amazing to learn all that about you. Um, how about you, Manu? Oh, hello, everybody. I can see lots of familiar names tuning in from all over the world. Um, my name is Manu. I'm a director of photography and also a budding producer. Ah, I started off almost 10 years ago. Well, not in the natural history, but more uh, started off as an animator. And storytelling has been at the backbone of um, my career. Um, I ended up picking up a camera sort of four years into my animation career. Um, primarily, I used to tell stories about um, mostly infomercials and uh, commercials. 
and for and, and sort of features for startups to you know to get their products out there but uh, it just wasn't you know doing it for me and i quickly got burnt out and i just needed to escape the city and so i kind of um stumbled my way into this career i just happened to have a camera and um, had built up enough skills to you know know at point the lens and how to keep things in focus um but then, yeah, um, got an opportunity in 2018 with Wild Earth, which Trishala also uh, works with. And we were based in the Mara for about two years doing live safaris. So those two years were like um, a boot camp for me. Like I was thrown into the deep end and I just had to figure things out and learn. But luckily, you know, there was a huge team of very skilled and very knowledgeable people who are happy enough to, you know, hold my hand and guide me through it. And yeah, four years later, I managed to break into sort of the blue chip natural history filmmaking, um, which is more, you know, glossier, uh, more bigger budgets and better cameras and, you know, bigger teams and crews and Sorry, I think we lost you, Manu. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, you're testing, back. Testing, Carry testing, testing. <laughs> um, where did you lose me? I'm sorry? Oh yeah, we lost where, you where? when you just said your name is Manu. No way. Anyway, <laughs> all right. You got jokes, Pauline. <laughs> I think um, you were just talking about how you transitioned from Wild Earth into the more glossier kind of roles now. Yeah, um, I mean, I can deep dive into that later on because there's a lot to share there. I don't want to give it all away. Um, maybe Wycliffe can go ahead and introduce himself and then um, we can jump into that later. Great. We'll come back to you. Um, so Wycliffe, uh, kindly tell us um, about yourself and the work that you're doing. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Pauline. And thank you to Wildscreen for having me today. Uh, my name is Wycliffe Odera. I'm a professional safari guide uh, for Garza and KPSD Assist. Um, I started off as a safari guide and I worked in the industry for uh, over four years. And then in the year 2020, uh, uh, when I just got back from uh, South Africa for further training, a friend of mine approached me and asked me if I would like to try something else. And this was uh, during COVID and things were really tough. So I said, yes, uh, why not? And he asked me if I could do a bit of presentation. And he brought me on board for Magical Kenya Live. We went all around the country doing live presentation and doing marketing for different um, safari circuits. Then after that, he again approached me and asked me if I would uh, try um, film driving. I didn't know anything about film driving and I had never heard of anything to do with that. So that was totally new to me. And I said, yes, why not? Uh, let's go out and try it. So we went out and we went to the Mara and I met really nice people. I met uh, Faith Musembi and I met a lady by the name Sue Gibson. Uh, she's a, a DOP. And she was so patient with me and she was understanding and she showed me a lot of stuff. And I gave it my all. I worked really hard and I guess I was impressive. Then after that, uh, Faith was um, so much interested in knowing what I really wanted to do. But being that I didn't really know about natural history filming and I'd never heard about it before, I didn't even know a way to get in. So I said, whatever comes, uh, I'll try it. And then Faith said, if you're keen on it, I would recommend you and I would uh, send your name out to other productions if they ever want to hire a driver. So then um, that's how it all started. And um, after that, um, she recommended me to several other productions. And now today, and actually right now I'm on location filming with uh, another company. So it's been um, a very short time and um, I've learned so much and uh, I think I'm now fully in and uh, this is what I want to do. I want to speak for Mother Nature. 
Amazing. That's um, that's such an amazing story to hear um, mm -hmm. about your transition in such a short, although not really short time. And mm -hmm. I know that that COVID did play a huge part in transitioning a lot of the people who are working in the natural history um, industry, especially in Africa, into kind of getting um, jobs that were not available before. So maybe we can get into that. How 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 do you feel your journey has been aided by um, certain circumstances, and um, do you think it's uh, it's a huge player in how you get to um, progress in your career? For example, for you, uh, weekly, if I'd say it's um, uh, it's it's COVID, and and for for Trishala, I know that she had to move from being a scientist and um, into this new world of presenting for wildlife and Manu with you working in the bush and then kind of getting this opportunity to jump. Um, how has that transition been for you and how important is it for those factors to have played out the way they did? Um, I'll start again randomly, just randomly select with Trishala. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was, I was quite lucky in that my transition happened before COVID hit, but um, I was also very lucky that COVID didn't really affect us. Maybe I should go back a little bit because your question was specifically about these um, these kinds of events and what yeah. they can do uh, to catalyze change, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so before I started with Wild Earth, I used to work in research science. So I used to work with the KwaZulu-Natal Sharks Board. So I was working with sharks um, and in the lab, in the field, things like that. That's what I love. I love animals. I love digging into things. I'm always walking around with my dissection kit. I have a very strong stomach. So I loved it. But 5,000 Rand a month was not cutting it. Um, um, you know, and it, it doesn't matter. I was still living at home. But unfortunately, it, I couldn't build anything from there. But I loved doing what I was doing. And I think this is a catalyst that everyone can kind of um, sympathize with and that you're earning too little um but you you, you know what you're doing is not terrible but you're still uh. earning too little um and you wish that you could earn more and you wish that you had steps to go further and you just can't um and then also the fact that you like what you do a little bit stops you as well because there's a comfort and these events that you're talking about like covid they pull you out of that that comfort um, and so what ended up happening is, it's not a very grand story, I must tell you at first. <laughs> <laughs> what ended up happening, all it was, was I loved my job. I didn't love how much I was getting paid. So I kept my eye out and I was looking for other opportunities. Okay. And I wasn't restricting myself to other opportunities in science specifically as in not in research science and not, not, I never wanted to go into like corporate level science. Um, but I kept all my options open, went for tons of interviews and while it was just one that came up, it came up, I had no on-screen experience. Um, I had never been to the bush before that, except as maybe a, like a very young child. Um, but I knew that I could give it a go. And For that sure. was the most important thing, is I decided to just give it a go, to just do something a little bit different to how I would normally do it. Um, and just very quickly, the way I got my job at Sharks Board um, when or well, quite fresh out of university was by that same rhythm. I knew that I liked labs. I knew that I liked sharks. I knew that I had to work for them, but they didn't have anything open. So I just... I just wrote them an email um, and said, if you ever have an opening, but it was not something I would ordinarily do. It was just a tiny step outside of what I would ordinarily do. Mm -hmm. And that kind of um, practice of just doing something a little bit outside of what you normally are comfortable doing has brought results throughout. So that would be my way to catalyze or take any event and let it be your catalyst. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I think I like that. It, it, I, what I'm hearing is it doesn't have to be a huge event. Sometimes it's tiny events that add up into 
you know. Yes. Um, I know if you've read the, the, that book, there's this famous book, Atomic Habits, that says if a train changes course, I think by one degree, moving from mm -hmm. one state to another, it would end up in a different whole state. And yeah, I think it's the same thing, do, doing something different um, and small actions add up to big events. So thanks for that. Um, Manu, do you think you have something similar or for you was it grand and happening all at once? No, it was a slow, really, really, really slow creeping process. I knew I've always been, I mean, I was lucky to, you know, be raised by a mom who was a biologist. Um, she taught biology in school. And so our house was just filled with all these biology books. And, you know, I'd read about frogs and spiders. And as a young boy, like I was never afraid to pick up a chameleon. And, and I mean, that I mean, usually had um, unfortunate results because our, our house helped would, you know, some of them would quit because of the superstition that was attached to handling chameleons. So I became notorious for that. And so like it's slowly been in the background and, um, I mean, when I was 28, I mean, just after transitioning from animation into photography and sort of, you know, experimental films, I remember I was on a shoot with this lady and it was a three day shoot and we got to become really good friends. And she was based in Tanzania. Um, so after the shoot, she, you know, she went back to Tanzania, and, but we kept in touch. And so a couple of weeks later, she messages me and is like, hey, Manu, um, I've got a friend looking for um, wildlife cameraman in Kenya. And do you know any? And I was like, um, hmm, let me just quickly check my Instagram. I remember seeing some people I'd followed who were posting, you know, pictures of elephants. And, and I assumed, oh, yeah, that, they're probably um, wildlife camera people. So I, I quickly, you know, sent them, sent her their profiles. And then she reached out to me another a week later and was like, uh, do you know anyone else? Like, um, I've reached out to them, but they don't really seem uh, that interested or probably didn't qualify. And this is, so, so for me, this was an opportunity that kept knocking on my door. And sometimes opportunities like this are very fleeting. Like, you won't even get a second chance to, you know, to seize them. So I was like, oh, and she just kind of was like, maybe you should try out for this role because, you know, you're creative, you're, you love animals and, and maybe you should try it out. And so I was like, oh, yeah, ooh, maybe I should. So to the first time, I actually had to write out my CV and I you know, did it overnight, quickly sent it and was like, ah, cool. if it happens, it happens. Um, and so um, this guy called Jondre, who, who Trishala knows, uh, reached out to me. And was like, um, hey Manu, um, we're we'll be setting up in the Mara in a couple of weeks. Um, it'd be good to meet you and you know, just have a brief chat. And so it just went on from there. Um a month later I was in the Mara. I think it was my first time in a national park. You know, it took me twenty eight to twenty nine years to get into a national park and wow. from then it's just been a blur. I mean, two years in the Mara. I don't even know how to describe it. It's like you almost detach yourself from the city life because we were there almost six mm -hmm. weeks on and would break for two weeks. And sometimes I'd stay on for those two weeks because I'd be like, oh, yeah, I can just go the, the Land Rovers. We could just take the Land Rover and drive into the park. We had access mm. at night as well. So it was a privilege to be exposed to that. And and I was like, there's no way I'm taking this opportunity for granted because it's so expensive to be able to, you know, stay in mm -hmm. the Mara for yeah. six weeks. Some people save up their entire life savings to just, you know, visit it for a week. So it was amazing. Um, so two years of that, I got to meet Faith. We started dreaming by the campfire about one day, you know, we're going to actually work with David Attenborough, you know, be on this big blue tip. Um, we actually have photos of, I wish we could share them here. We have photos oh. of me and Faith just by the campfire, just... Um, you know, throwing dreams into the fire. And and some of these dreams have actually come true. Um, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, most of them have come true and actually exceeding our expectations. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah, being able to recognize opportunities when they right. present themselves and also, you know, grabbing those opportunities and going full force and, and not looking back. Um, I would say, yeah, those that's my secret sauce. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing that secret sauce with us. <laughs> okay. And and for you, Wycliffe, um, I know we've touched on, on COVID being um, a huge thing that um, that uh, contributed to how much um, you moved from one place to another in the industry. But um, do you feel like there were special moments for you that kind of defined, you know, um, actually transitioning into uh, a natural um, history uh, filmmaker? Hello. Come on again. Okay. Sorry, um, I'm just trying to recount the story of um, you transitioning from uh, being a guide and into um, a specialist driver in the natural history and filmmaking industry and, and how COVID played a part in that. Sorry, I lost you for a while. Um, yeah. Oh, no. So yeah, um, <clears throat> A uh, signal is not so strong. I'm in the Mara, so okay, it's okay. a bit patchy. But uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, whatever I get, I'll get. Okay. <laughs> so, could you, could you kindly repeat your question again? Not to worry. Um, I was just going over how much yeah. um COVID had a, a hand in playing, uh, when it comes to you transitioning from being a guide, um, when you came back from your training and into um, getting into the natural history filmmaking industry. Um, but you had touched on it before, so maybe it would- it yes, so, uh, Oh no, I think Wycliffe is frozen. Okay, we'll just come back to him. Um, it's we'll come back to you Wycliffe. Not to worry, we can just, uh, we'll carry on and then probably by the next round, um, we hope that, that our signal will be on our side. <laughs> Great, um, awesome. so I know that we've spoken about our different routes into the industry. Um, as I know, that's going to be um, the one thing that people in the um, comment section might maybe want to ask about how did you get in? And I think another big thing that we need to talk about even before we can get into um, advice and challenges and that kind of thing is so far, so far, how much do you feel you've done that you're proud of? And I mean, sometimes it's um, NDAs and all of that, but what is already out there that you can talk about as uh, your contribution to the industry and something that you're proud of as a natural history filmmaker? Let's start with you, Manu. Um, hmm, my proudest achievement. I feel like I'm still, I'm just getting started. Like I'm still warming up to it. <laughs> it's such a it slow have, process have in this. I well, I, yes. I, I would say my first blue chip uh, shoot that I worked on, I would say, mm -hmm. for many reasons. Um, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was. It was a really long shoot in Savo East, in Savo generally, the whole Savo East and West ecosystem. Um, but also kind of the most rewarding um, because I started off as a camera assistant um, and, you know, I was charging batteries. I was making sure the main DOP, you know, had his kits ready uh, the night before, um, cleaning the lenses and, you know, just, asking as many questions as I could to just figure stuff out because I hadn't really worked on the bigger um, uh, camera rigs and the reds and all this. Um, so, you know, coming from a broadcast um, industry into like more blue chip, slower, you know, you thinking of building sequences and figuring out the story and, you know, because with, with live TV, it's just, you're out there, you're reacting and, you know, Trish, for example, was a presenter. And so I'm driving, she's driving around, mic'd up and, you know, whatever we find, if it's a rhino, we just, you know, zoom into that and Trish is just fabricating, not fabricating, but like narrating a story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and just, you know, narrating hey, events you. as they presented themselves. And so mm. the story would unfold before our very own eyes. And it was great for me because, um, as, or as a camera person, because you had to be really, on point, like your shot had to be steady, you had to be in focus. This is live, there's no retakes, you know. And so I feel like I brought that skill set into uh, Blue Chip and it kind of helped me progress. And like I said, it was a three month shoot. 
um, two weeks in, um, I was slowly progressing, you know, up and up and up and building confidence. Um, the directors were like, oh, okay, he actually knows this stuff. And that was just <laughs> me staying up all night Googling stuff and asking <laughs> questions and having to learn things really quickly is what mm. is a really good skill set um, in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was lucky on this shoot. It was a big production. There were about four or five DOPs. And one of the one of the cameramen, um, what was his name? Tom Wycliffe, you've worked with him on Wildstar on the gimbal shoot. I forgot his name. Um, but yeah, he had his extra um, camera. Is it si Um he he had an si extra camera. Si 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 Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I think there's some breakup with uh, weekly fashion. I've asked him a question. Um, so he happened to have his own personal camera on on, mm -hmm. on set. And um, he was like, oh, oh, yeah. So towards closer towards the end of the shoot, there were some sequences that, you know, we didn't manage to get that were still pending. And um, there happened to, an extra, to be an extra camera on set. And so... He was like, um, yeah, maybe Manu should just, I've got an extra camera. Maybe Manu should get it and, you know, go and figure it out and go film the sequence. And so that's what happened. And I'd never used this camera before. It was a Panasonic Varicam. And so I only had like 10 minutes to figure it out. He kind of showed me what was happening, what, you know, the settings and the menus and everything. And I was recording it on my iPhone just in <laughs> case I forgot something and, you know, I had to like play it back. And, and so, yeah, that was it. Like, like I said, again, opportunities present themselves. And you either back out of them or you like, you know, grab them by the by the horns. And so I was yeah. like, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. Um, so I set off and, you know, just filmed the sequence for the rest of the shoot. Um, I didn't manage to get the entire sequence, but I got enough of it that made it into the film. And this film was called Our Great National Parks. Um, that was narrated by hey. former Woo. president of the U.S. Obama. And yeah, that was a proud achievement for me. I came back home broken. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just I was just a new dad, so um, um, my daughter was about four months, I think, five months, maybe close to a year. And I only saw her for a day because I came back home for a day out of three months. Mm -hmm. And so I came back home really broken. But you know, it was a bittersweet uh, opportunity and mm -hmm. kind of paved the way for me um, and opened up other doors. Okay. All right. And I think that's that's um, a reality for a lot of people who are going to be working in this industry. And a lot of people give you stories of how they have missed, you know, a, mi a minute at home or something, because sometimes you're out, you know, for, as you said, Manu, for weeks, you know, mm -hmm. and without any breaks to go back home. But um, I love I love it every time you tell it this story, because it just it just shows how much um, how much zeal you have for this industry and, and it makes you as good as you are. And I mean, a great national parks is not, is not a small feat. And every time I see it on Netflix, I go, Woo <laughs> <don't want> <laughs> yeah. so you yeah. should be, um, really proud of yourself. yeah. Um, Thank and you. how about you, Trishala? Um, what's, what's your proudest moment in the industry so far? Um, this is going to sound very cheesy, but I, I will qualify it. Uh, I think it's right now. Oh yeah, because I mean I'm a presenter, so I don't I don't often get to create things. I'm mm -hmm. on the the other side. So there's the the production company, there's the the production staff, there's the cameraman. Everybody is part of this this creation altogether. So I don't get to create something on my own, mm. but. Um, at the very beginning, I didn't create anything at all. And like Manu said, like, you know, he was thrown into the deep end with Wild Earth and going to the Mara with Jean Dre. Um, but he was lucky to have so many people that were willing to help him and just hold his hand, a whole team of extraordinary people. And I had the exact same experience, although here in South Africa as opposed to the Mara. And um, when I had just started, it was... I didn't get to present for about three months. All I was doing was being absolutely uh, smashed by other presenters, ego getting beaten down by big <laughs> personalities. James Henry, you know, 
with pitchforks poking at us um, <laughs> and and babysat animals and had to track animals so there was no mm. screen time in that in that in those three months it was just doing everything else for everybody else um, and it was totally invaluable because I wouldn't have I had nothing before that and suddenly after three months I felt like I had something something substantial um, and being a presenter is is really really difficult because there's two really important parts of who you are mm -hmm. and that is how you present you know your personality I don't mean as a presenter but as you present in life mm -hmm. and um, and your job those are two really big parts of yourself and as a presenter it's really pushed together and molded into one thing and then on top of that you're one thing that everybody else can have a go at from the comfort of of wherever mm. of their home. and um, if it weren't for this experience probably would never have learned that much I'm talking about that three months of just being somebody else's slave you know <laughs> um, the, learned so much grew in so much in confidence considering I had no screen experience before that uh, and I learned to have a tough skin and mm. having a tough skin is really 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 important in this industry because people want the best um, and they don't want they want the best out of you so it's not just the best for for the the film or um, if you're in production or presenting, it's the best out of you. They want you to deliver the best that, that you can. Yeah. Um, and you don't know what your best is sometimes. And sometimes your best doesn't feel like enough and you feel so shit about it. Um, but you got to get a thick skin and eventually you do. And suddenly you become somebody that you hope that you were a couple of years mm. ago. And that's why my answer was right now, because between starting in wildlife filmmaking to now, I've also done a bit of production work um, and like script writing, things like that, uh, as well as like research leads for another company that I worked at, uh, Rewild Africa. I was part of their production side. So I was the research lead for one of their pilot episodes of a series that they were making. Um, all those things right now my skill set feels like I can do anything mm -hmm. uh, while that filmmaking and sometimes it feels like that um, but that doesn't mean you can there's still so many mm. other things to do but yeah but it I feel like I am equipped and the only reason I I feel that way is because I took these other small opportunities these fleeting opportunities like Manu said and um, I took them and so right now I feel really proud of myself because I have collected oh. these bits of skill um, yeah. and like everybody in the wildlife filmmaking industry Manu still has ideas that he really wants to wants to produce I still have series that I really want to produce um, and the tough part is taking all the things you know and applying it mm. to different projects. Um, and sometimes it's not enough and sometimes it is. It's just a matter of pushing. Amazing. I, I totally um, relate to, to your story and, and just feeling very proud of your potential currently because sometimes it's easy to overlook that by saying, you know, I haven't done the biggest blue chip film. I haven't, you know, worked with David or whoever. But sometimes when you look at yourself and, and realize that you're not where you were a couple of years back and that now you're more confident or you're like Manu now moving from a cinematographer to a producer, you know, that's like two in one roles. Um, that kind of potential is worth celebrating. So for anyone who's joining um, the industry now and feels like they have a long way to go, just know you'll have many tiny milestones to celebrate in terms of your potential growing and your ability to trust in yourself. It's the kind of confidence that comes from competence and you can only get it from working and you know moving. So thank you so much for sharing that, Kishala. Amazing. Um, so Wycliffe, um, fingers crossed that your internet is on our side now. Um, what, what, what would you say is your biggest achievement or something that you're most proud of um, in terms of work in the industry? 
Can you so, hear us? Uh, yes. Hello, Colleen. Hello, I can me? hear you. Yes. All right, okay. Okay, uh, for me, my proudest moment is always when, um, when I'm working with a DOP. And I've, I've been lucky to, like, I would say that when I got into the industry, I went straight to blue chip. And I've worked with some of the most uh, top uh, cinematographers and DOPs. And I've worked with Manuel Casa, by the way. And I'm always happy when they put trust in me and they let me decide, like, what, what do you want to do? And even at some point, they let me suggest uh, the shots that I think would work. And then, mm -hmm. um, like, when they bring the idea to the table and say, OK, this is what we are aiming to achieve. What's your thought? What do you think? And um, for me, that that moment, I feel like I'm part of it and I'm contributing in making that story and making it to be whatever it's going to be. And um, that's always like my moment and I uh, feel proud of it. But as everyone has said, um, in this industry, you really need to work hard and you need to prove it because uh, everyone, like all the productions are looking for the best. They don't just take people because you know someone or because you are there. No, you really have to prove yourself and you really have to put a lot of work into it. And if you do that, then you, you just, um, you'll be a nail for yourself. And tomorrow somebody will reach, uh, will reach out to you and just ask you if you are available and uh, can you join us? Can you come with us? Yeah. So I think that's how it is. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I love to hear that. And it also makes me very happy to know that there are people who, um, there are many people you will work with who are very open to hearing about um, what ideas you can bring um, to the production. And I thank God that we work in a in an industry that has a lot of that. I don't, I, I know that there's some people whose experience is not exactly like that, but in many cases, mm -hmm. you'll find that you're being asked, what can we do? What's your opinion and all of that. And I think one piece of advice that I hear going around for a lot of Africans is we've not been in this industry for a long time or been as exposed, but it doesn't mean that your opinions are not valid, you know? speak up if something is not right let people know in the production and they will um nine out of ten times appreciate that so um i'm loving how the conversation is going i'd love us to um get into some questions in a few but before that i would like to ask um another round of questions to all of you which is um one, how do you identify opportunities? Because I know we have a lot of people and I can see some of the comments coming in um, looking like, um, I need to know where can I get an opportunity to just try. Um, I feel too old. That one should never be a concern for anyone. I know everyone will tell you. <laughs> uh, you're never too old to start um, and as long as you have the passion for it. So a question for all of you is, how do you identify um, opportunities? so that you can you know employ yourself and 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 just run with it so let me start with Wycliffe now that we have you <laughs> so um thank you once again for me um how to identify opportunities in this industry um it's not so easy and it's not difficult and uh, you have to position yourself to that and by positioning yourself, what I mean is that you have to create a name for yourself. Because like Manu says, um, when when you get credits for um, projects that you worked for, people will start looking for you. And that's an opportunity for you. But if you are a new person and you're just beginning, you first of all need to identify what exactly do you want to do. The industry is big. Um, there's a um, DOP, um, like a, a camera person like Manu. There's a presenter. Um, there's a guide like me. So you really need to identify and know exactly what, uh, where, where you want to get uh, um, yourself into. You need to work towards that. So I'll speak for myself, for example, um, to become um, um, a specialist camera driver. First of all, you need to be a safari guide and you need to be a very good one, not just a safari guide. You need to know you are... Um, your ethology. You need to learn animals and understand them deeply. You need to be a very patient person. You need to be open to learning because every now and then you'll be learning new things and you need to be curious. 
you need to be someone who is willing to help everyone because um, once say for example if you get that opportunity to drive that vehicle it's not just driving you are looking and um, most of the time the camera person will be looking into the viewfinder they will not know what's going on in the surrounding it's your business to make sure that uh, you let them know what's going on it's like uh, you are guiding a blind person and you help them cross the road you help them do whatever they want to do so you you have to be that person you have to be a very patient person if you're filming say for example like uh, lions most of the time they spend their time just sitting down doing nothing if you're not patient enough you're going to get tired and bored and this is not the industry for you again um you must be ready to be corrected sometimes you make decisions that are wrong and you need to work as a team when these people choose you they choose you because they trust you to some degree. they know that you can make the right decisions and they know that you know what you are doing so that's and uh, that uh, comes to um, knowing the animals deeply so that you make sure that whatever you say is accurate because they rely on you to say that this is going to happen and it happens sure. that's how you get into it but then sometimes if you don't get it right then be ready to be corrected if they correct you don't take it in a bad way take it in a positive way and that way you grow that way and uh, people will start wanting to work with you because they know that you are you are open to learning and you are an easy going person and you must be also be ready to um be um, um like a, a team person you must be able to work as a team okay okay i'm hearing a lot of lessons in that um and you're actually answering even the question of um what kind of uh, wisdom or advice would you give to someone joining the kind of industry you're in right now so thank you for also giving all those uh, tips on how to you know get in and stay in so thank you so much Wycliffe are you frozen yeah okay great just when we got everything <laughs> awesome so i'm going to move to you uh, trishala same question how do you identify um opportunities and also um kind of wisdom for someone who wants to get into being a wildlife presenter i think that uh, what wickliff said about having an idea of where you want to go so that you can actually search for opportunities within that uh, that framework is very very helpful and um, it's not something that i did i think if i did it probably would have sped up the process a little bit um, but i don't i don't regret it because i kind of had a hand in in lots of little pies if that makes sense mm. and so i'm happy at the way it, it turned out but definitely identifying what part of the industry you want to be part of is really a great way to um, also for yourself to figure out what it is that you want to do and have a bit of focus um i think it's really important to know when you start off that the jobs that you're going to be taking are not going to be glamorous jobs they're not going to be mm -hmm. um they're going to be really they uh they might not be very tough they might just be you know standing around with gaffer tape them it might <laughs> yeah. be um following someone around uh mm. so it's unglamorous in that sense but it is so valuable because those people that will allow you to shadow them for a day or mm. to just be on set or to just jump in the back of the game drive vehicle those people become people that know your potential mm -hmm. exactly like wickliff was saying when people hire you or people say yes to you they don't do it because you're irritating them they do it because they see something in you and that's valuable that potential that they see in you is valuable mm -hmm. so even though you need to learn you're there for a reason and so take every one of those little opportunities as a positive reflection of the potential someone sees in you mm. and just jump on board so to identify opportunities i mean quite frankly just take any you can get because you mm. can always you can always stop doing something 
it's getting started that's really difficult yeah um and then just in terms of like average or general advice um this might be a slightly unpopular one but it's always especially if you're starting off um and you're and you're still quite young i think it's always important to have something else backing you up um whether that means that you have a um some other certificates or skills or um a degree but something else that can be your foundation because this whole process of wildlife filmmaking can take years sure. getting yeah. a series funded and then getting a team and filming can take years and years and years a lot of the a time, lot of time you um you don't have any other income during that time if you are not um if you don't have some some other backing so it's important to find some foundation um elsewhere because mm. more often than not you need it um and then finally mm -hmm. uh, goals can change dreams can change um what i thought were my goals and dreams 2 years ago are different to what they are now uh, and that's okay you don't have to stick to to something big things big things we thought that that, thought was that was so um that goals can change your aims can change uh your skill set can change and mm. it's a very it's a very fluid kind of um process and so allow yourself to to move with it because that's the way you're going to get the best out of it amazing i love love that and it's something that i've seen also um with many people in the industry they start out with something and then in the middle they want to try something different so yeah i think remaining open to change is a very um good piece of advice how about you manu uh, when it comes to identifying opportunities and a bit of advice that is a tough question mainly because for me it's a mix of so many things some that i take credit for but some of which you know I give credit to people that I've met along the way that I've mm -hmm. been lucky enough to be mentored by or you know I've been curious enough to ask them and bombard them with so many questions because I just wanted to learn more stuff. I think it comes down to information because the more you know the more you mm -hmm. can you know it opens up so many other avenues. Um yeah. so for me yeah I mean besides sometimes just sheer luck and opportunities presenting themselves sometimes it's best if you have some sort of leverage um whether it's you know having a portfolio or a show reel ready like for example when when after my two year stint in the mara that got cut short due to a buyout i think it was disney that got bought out by I'm not mm. sure who yeah. contract came to an end we were made redundant we were given notice but we were still made redundant and i was like Oh my god is this is this it is this the end of a two year dream but then I was like I quickly snapped out of it and was like okay what do I need to do okay I've got two years of footage amazing moments um maybe I should just quickly you, you know put together a show reel it wasn't as quick as I thought <laughs> it took about <laughs> two months um and I remember the first show reel I made was some 10 minutes long and it was just too long and i started sharing that with you know with people established dops and producers in the industry some didn't get back to me and i was like okay fine and some did get back to me and told me um you know maybe you should cut it make it make it shorter make it 3 minutes um and you see so this is information i didn't have and i you know i listened and i brought it down to 3 minutes and i had a show reel and then you know i started sending it out to production houses all across the globe again most of them didn't reply and it can be a bit heartbreaking but then covid happened which is another opportunity um you know and and i i'm i'm happy that you know i put the word out there that hey i'm a dop from kenya this is my show reel and most of them mm. started responding because they couldn't fly in because of obviously travel restrictions and so sometimes it's good to be ready when opportunities present themselves it's never enough just to be presented with opportunities you kind of have to have some sort of leverage um and be able to you know capitalize take that opportunity 
Um, but so, you yeah, know, that's one step getting your foot in the door. And then it's another thing building trust because, you know, once you have an opportunity, what do you do with it then? Um, and I mean, we were lucky enough, like Faith and I um, got on a shoot, a wild star shoot called Quinn's, which mm -hmm. I can't wait to, I can't wait to see. I think it should be out soon. Um, and wild star, kudos to wild star for, for, you know, taking the gamble. And, and taking the risk. They sent us all the equipment um, via plane and sent us off with the field. Faith and I, Faith was, I think, field producer at that point. I was the DOP and Stanley, who's an amazing um, filming guide and driver. It was just a, the team of three. And, and for me, it was like, wow, this is the first time a fully fledged African crew was out mm -hmm. in the field working on a blue chip series. And so, you know, there we go, another opportunity, but then, you know, we have to build that trust and build that confidence. And mm -hmm. we've got, we feel like we're ambassadors at this point, because, you know, if we mess it up, <laughs> they'll be like, yeah. ah, okay, you know, <laughs> we tried. Um, so, you know, always always being in a position where you feel like you're, you're responsible for those who are coming after you and, mm -hmm. you know, setting the bar really high and, um, you know, doing the best you can. Um, but also, you know, in the same vein, it wasn't easy. Um, luckily, we had really good mentors. Uh, Sophie Darlington, who was the DOP on Queens, was my mentor. And we would upload rushes at the end of the day. Rushes are pretty much what you shot that day and, you know, compile it into like a, a video. And we would send that um, to them. And Frame.io, which is a cloud-based service where you can, you know, upload videos and people can comment on them. So the directors in Bristol and uh, producers would, would would watch our rushes and would like give feedback and like you know um, your shot was a bit too tight there um, mm -hmm. you're changing shot sizes too quickly and um, and you know meanwhile I'm taking this this feedback and you can either take can it either positively, positively or you can be defensive and try and explain yourself like oh no the the fluid head wasn't level or it was windy mm -hmm. that day but you're just like just take it on the chin. And I think that that came as a, as a result of being uh, in Wild Earth, where it was brutal, like um, Trishala was saying. Oh, yeah, at the, the training. end of the day, mm. yeah, at the end of the day, we'd, we'd sit in the control room and watch what we filmed that day, like watch our live segments. And we would just get, you know, it was constructive criticism, criticism, but sometimes it was so brutal. Mm. Uh, you'd feel like you know your ego is bruised and you, sometimes you feel like you, you're down that night but you know after a few beers of the campfire you'd be like ah it's fine you know it's you're still good <laughs> you're good to go you've got another opportunity the next day and you know you can you can start a fresh slate um have i really answered the question you, like have, you have no 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 actually you haven't even gone into an, another question i was gonna ask you guys about yeah. mentorship and all of that so this is good it's going well um but i know we're running a bit out of time so we are going to get into the q a session um but i really love that response it's all about getting information lost you pauline It's time for you to shine, Manu. <laughs> back up presented. Go. Oh, no. <laughs> You're back. Thank you. Oh, no. I told you that would happen. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I'm going to go quickly through the questions so that um, we can answer some of the concerns from the guys who are attending. I'll just pick randomly someone to answer. So stay ready. <laughs> There's um, someone called Ashish who's asking, is there a formal path to break into um, professional wildlife filmmaking for someone who comes from a non-biological background, um, says in brackets, engineering background to be precise, but had been doing some photography and watching wildlife uh, films since more than 10 years ago out of deep interest and passion. For example, courses like Masters in Wildlife Filmmaking by University of Bristol and a few others. Apologies, it's a long one. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. But um, yeah, definitely. I think I can. I can. I can definitely speak on that. I know that we have um, 
many, many universities right now and many institutions that offer wildlife filmmaking courses. So if you truly want to go the, um, the formal way and get education before getting into the industry, it's definitely advisable. It's not the only way, but it's definitely advisable and you can get, you can seek out help um, from the institutions directly or even from people who've gone there before. Um, I hope that answers your question, Ashish. Uh, Charlie is asking, I have a large amount of experience with gimbal systems used for long uh, lens work. I have a passion for natural history and conservation and my goal is to work in the field. I believe that my skill set, oh no, sorry. I believe that my skill set would be valuable. How would you recommend that I go about breaking into this area? So I think Manu, you can answer this um, uh, about gimbal experience and long lens work. So I'm gonna ask you guys to answer as short, as quickly as possible, because we have a couple of them so that we can kind of touch on everything. Shoot for it, Manu. Um, so yeah, this is Charlie. Um, again, building leverage. So you do have experience. Do you have anything to show for it? Um, I mean, if you do have the experience and you have the equipment at your disposal, I would, you've probably done this, so forgive me if I'm, preaching to the choir. Um, I would head out to a national park if you have access to one and just film some stuff. Or, you know, if you have access to, if you have a short film that you'd like to make, it doesn't have to be long, it can be three, four minutes, or it could just be a sizzle of, you know, your gimbal shots. I would just go out there and shoot that stuff and edit it really well, add some music to it, and, you know, even try and try and make a sequence, like a gimbal sequence. Sometimes just pretty shots don't really cut it. Sometimes um, if you can build a sequence just on gimbal work, that kind of tells a story um, or even mix it up with your long lens work. Cause you, you see most of these shows there's you know, gimbal sequences that, mm -hmm. that justify gimbal work. You know, sometimes you find it's just too much gimbal work and the, the tool has to, you have to think of the story first and what's the best tool for the job. So if you can maybe cut together a sequence that shows your skills in both long lens and gimbal work, then I would go for it. Um, hopefully you have access to, you know, some of these amazing natural parks, national parks that we we get to film in. If not, film your dog or something, <laughs> or some sort of animal, or if you have access to horses, it doesn't have to be wild animals. You know, most of these stories are also could be you know of animals that you have access to whether it's cows you can still make an amazing story about cows grazing in the fields and put your skills and to the and insects another actually that's a good point insects are a big one for me as well because with insect photography you can even be in your garden i remember during lockdown that's what kept me sane because you know if i go a week without turning on my camera <laughs> I'll just start my palms will start itching so i remember we were limited with how far we could move and suddenly I just realized like, hey, yeah, insects. And you'd be surprised, just like a square, 10 square meters of, you know, grass or, you know, forest and foliage, it's so much, there's so much you could film in there. And yeah, insects are a big one. Awesome. I'm actually now getting into macro photography and filming mm -hmm. right this year. So yeah, it's a big one. Okay. I hope I've answered his question. Yeah, I think you have answered it. And um, I also wanted to say that if it's okay with everyone on the panel, um, maybe Wildscreen can share your contacts with um, the people who attended today. And then if they have follow-up questions, because I think they might have from your answers, they can um, maybe write you an email and and you can help them out. Is that cool? Um, sorry, I just see Charlie has answered. He says he has a showreel, both ground-based and aerials. Mm -hmm. Who do I reach out to? Charlie, do you mind answering where you're based? If it helps. Um, but hey, you could reach out to anyone. Um, one thing I like doing is every time I watch these natural history shows, I like reading the credits. That's one mm -hmm. thing I always, I always pause like after each page and, hmm, is that the director? Okay, I'm going to Google them. Um, reach out to them like, hey, that was an amazing show. Um, I'm based in Kenya. Mm -hmm. This is my show reel. It's actually, yeah, you kind of need to do a bit of admin work. I call it admin work. I usually dedicate sometimes just a Monday to do admin work and reach out mm -hmm. to people. 
because sometimes you can be the best um, director of photography, but if you're not really speaking out and reaching out to people, then yes. no one will really know you exist. Mm. And you'll be beating yourself up like, oh, no, I'm so good, but no one's really noticing me. But um, you really have to be proactive and reach out to people. I would say just pick your favorite, um, you know, blue chip productions that you've watched recently. Go through the credits, Google those people. Most of them have Instagram profiles and you reach out to them. You'll probably know what production house uh, worked on it. And um, But yes, she says the New Zealand... Hmm. I don't know much about New Zealand and um, the Southern, but hey, it doesn't really matter where you're from. I mean, pretty much if you could attend also these festivals, um, this year we had an amazing festival in South Africa called uh, New um, Congress. Um, there was people from all over the world that came and attended. And obviously Wildscreen is one of them. And just try and save up and, and attend these um, festivals as well. I, I I took the gamble last year and spent close to two thousand dollars, and it's it's paid off almost tenfold uh, because I you know I put myself out there. I, took, I invested in myself. Sometimes besides time, you need to invest money in yourself and and go put yourself out there and attend these festivals and get people, you know, to know you and what you do. Um, hopefully awesome. that helps. And just for, for, uh, sorry, just for Charlie, very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on that side of the world, so I grew up in in Melbourne for I mean, for a few years when I was in high school. So I attended high school in Melbourne, um, and I remember I don't know if they still do this, but I remember that the ABC and SBS, the television television channels, um, used to do uh, used to have like competitions for best video, best photograph, that kind of thing. Just use those avenues as well. They might not be as um, as blue chip or anything like that, but it, it might be a nice springboard. Uh, and then also for the law, um, I think it was the first question, Ashish who wanted to get into wildlife filmmaking and had a background in engineering. You might also try to consider broadcast systems or getting into broadcasting from the technical perspective. Uh, as opposed to getting in front of the camera on, or behind the camera straight away because that might follow your suit a little bit better and eventually you will get where you where you want to be. Awesome. Great. Thanks, guys, for answering um, Chitali. I'm sure he has now um, enough information to go by. And if you need to ask anything more or any clarifications, Chitali, I'm sure... Um, wild screen can put you in touch with both Trishala and um, Manu. Um, great. So um, we have another question from Pranesh. Um, the question is, how do you prepare for the unexpected in the field? For instance, being charged by a rhino or an elephant. <laughs> um, I think quickly if you can take this. <laughs> so uh, uh, the question is from Pranesh. Pranesh. Yeah. Okay. So Pranesh, um, um, when when you're out in the wild, you always have to be aware of your surrounding, and that's that's the one reason you need to really understand all the animals, and you need to know which animal you're approaching. For example, you need to read the body language of an elephant. You need to read the body language of a rhino or even a lion, so that you know that um, I'm too close or this is a comfort zone for this particular animal. If you always stay within the comfort zone of the animal, they will never charge you. But if you push them too much, then you leave them with no option. In that kind of situation, you really don't have much uh, space to do anything because they will be charging and they will be running uh, towards you. If you have a vehicle, the, the best you can try to do is to reverse and try to get out of this way. But in most scenarios, they will try to um, topple the vehicle. For example, a rhino can uh, horn a vehicle, try to roll it. An elephant would push a vehicle. So always, always make sure that you give animal their space. If you give them their spaces, they will never charge you, I think. Um, can I, I add to that? Mm -hmm. So yep. what he said is very, very true. And sometimes ask DPs 
can be notorious because we want to get, you know, we're like, hey, we could, could you get me a bit closer? I'd like to get a big close up of the eye or, you know, something. Mm-hmm. And if, if you don't trust your, you know, your guide or expert filming driver who's got vast amount of knowledge, then sometimes you could put yourself in such scenarios where, you know, okay, you're overriding Wycliffe's advice because you want to get the shot, but you know, you're putting yourself at risk. And I think I'm just calling out myself as well because I've done it before. And uh, it's a thing to look out for. And um, I mean, we, the last shoot we were on Wycliffe and it was, I don't know if I can talk about it, but we were looking for, we actually specifically went out on that shoot to get very specific behavior. And it's a long time of waiting and, you know, um, and waiting and watching and waiting and watching and driving. And then when that moment actually happens, it can be overwhelming because, you know, you really want to get the shot. You don't want that opportunity to, 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 you know, to fly by. And you really have to have that chemistry with, with your, with your, with your guide and really have to, you know, bounce back ideas like, because I remember weekly, if it happened, it was about, what, 30 minutes we had to film that. And, you know, weekly was always like looking out um, and, you know, communicating with me, oh, there's, there's a bull coming in, we, we can't get close. And I'm like, okay, it's, yeah, I'm just going to have to bite that one. Probably won't get the shot, but, you know, just safety is, is always paramount and you really have to respect and, and trust your guide and, you know, not override their um, advice just to get the shot because you mm-hmm. can put yourself in very really dangerous um, scenarios and it's expensive stuff <laughs> besides i mean the kit is insured it's it's if you lose a limb or you know get your your exactly. thumb, <laughs> you know yeah okay punctured Great. by rhino horn <laughs> <laughs> i know there's no coming Actually. back from that yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to take just two last questions because I know we're really pushing it on the time, but um, great conversation. I know we could keep going forever. Um, I have one question that came in yesterday um, when I asked um, on a certain forum to get questions. And someone asked, I'm an enthusiastic photographer, I recently gained interest in filmmaking. How do I become a professional in the industry now that companies require an experienced person, even for volunteer work? And at what point of my career would one refer to me as a professional filmmaker? And yeah, I thought I thought it's something to speak about because I see a lot of people coming in and wondering why they have to, you know, do six months internships or shadow someone for, you know, a month or, you know, and that's that's someone that probably has a portfolio, um, a, a photography background or something of the sort. And I know that I know that the jobs are very competitive, although it is starting to grow in Africa and we're getting more and more companies focusing on natural history and we're also getting um, players from um, uh, international, you know, players coming in and saying we want to work with you and we want to broaden the job opportunities. But I think it's very paramount to remember that you're going to be, um, as Trisha mentioned a while a while ago, in jobs that you're not very happy with, or you're going to be termed as an intern or an entry level point um, person until they kind of trust you. Now that the thing that Manu talked about, trust is very big in the industry, and people need to be sure the work that you're doing is to a certain standard. So I don't think it's, um, it, it, it just, it doesn't disqualify your work. That's all I need to say that it doesn't disqualify your work or your experience. It only means that you need to kind of prove yourself a bit more and then kind of earn your place because that answers it. Um, I know we can speak a lot more about this, but let me ask um, a different question about that's kind of related. Um, Pranesh asked, talking about mentorship and coaching, what are the platforms or forums where inspiring, sorry, aspiring creators can tap into the experienced minds of people who've walked the walk before? And I'll ask everyone to maybe give um, give their own experience on this. But off, the, off my mind, I can uh, repeat that we have NUF, which is Nature, Environment, Wildlife and sorry, Nature, Environment, Wildlife Filmmakers, which is an African community that um, has producers, scientists, um, cinematographers and a lot of people working in the in the natural history industry um, coming together every year for the congress and the conference and I know that um, they're open all year with this kind of trainings and labs and all of that happening in the southern Africa um, part of the 
of the continent. And I know that we have Films for African Wildlife, which is a community we have um, that is uh, run here in Kenya, but you know, it's open to everyone all over Africa and beyond. And I know we also have communities now such as Wild Screen and um, the Jackson Wild and the, um, all these festivals happening. And I cannot say that I know all of them, but I know that um, there are many more that I also personally don't know about. But the thing is you need to be able to get this information and just follow one and it kind of opens you up to all these others that you can plug into. So I'll ask, um, I'll ask Georgia and Amelia who are helping us in the background to just kind of link all of these um, uh, communities and then people can go and do some more research. Yeah, so if I haven't mentioned anything, this is your point. Um, my dear speakers to mention it as you give us uh, your last words and last pieces of um, wisdom to the attendees today. Let's go with you. With um, okay, go with before. Oh, you I'm it. sorry, uh, Wycliffe, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I'm here. I'm not lost, I'm here, Pauline. Awesome. So um, do you have any special communities you have as a um, specialist driver in the industry that you can ask people to plug into? Well, for me, I always try to follow the tech side of things, mm -hmm. and which is mainly the, the equipment you use in the field, like um, the cameras, the gimbals, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So I follow them on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, so that if there's something new that has been released, I want to learn about that particular thing. Because uh, you find that my area of um, work in this industry, there's a lot of attention like it would be given um, uh, operator. Or, so, You're breaking uh, weekly, but I Hello. did get the first part. Hello. Hello. Great. I, I, did, I you... didn't finish. Uh, yes, carry on, carry on. I think we lost you, but now you're back. All right. <laughs> it's a patchy <laughs> signal. Uh, yeah. You forgive me for that. So yeah. So what I was saying is that my my sector is not given much um, attention like the other sectors. For example, if the bursaries come, they come for other sectors. Mm. So my um, not guiding and that kind of stuff and driving is not given much more attention. So it's uh, my business to make sure that I try to follow the technology that is new so that whenever we go out in the field, I know which camera we are operating and I know how to take care of it. I know how to yeah. rig it. That way I add value to whoever I'm working with. So for anyone who would want to get into the industry, one thing that I would say is that uh, we, we, we should, and uh, for my fellow Africans, we should know that the industry is uh, broad. We have the sound, we have, um, we have uh, narration like uh, Trishala. We have other things that can be done. You don't, you don't necessarily have to be a camera person or a producer yeah. to, to be in the industry. Mm. It's why and you can start on any other area. So mm. just um, have passion and do a lot of research because we do not have a school in Africa that is training people to that is training people to become uh, camera drivers or cameramen or, or that kind of stuff for natural history. So it's upon you to work on it, get that passion and follow follow these production in the, uh, production uh, companies and even locally join this group so that you, you are aware and you know what's going on, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, I think that's well said. And yeah, it's always a good thing to follow who's shooting what and with what. Um, so if, if you can, as Manu said, again, get as much information and follow as many people in the industry as possible. Um, Manu, how about you? Plus your last words. I might, I might have a whole paragraph. <laughs> I have so many parting shots. Um, one, I mean, sometimes we were so focused on like, you know, looking up and climbing up and, you know, reaching out to people who are more skilled than us, more experienced than us, um, mm. getting on bigger productions. Um, but recently, especially this year, um, 
I've been inspired by, you know, like communities like Newf, especially in Africa. And mm. I've really, I'm really inspired on, in, 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 you know, building and developing communities here and mm. lifting up people who are, you know, just getting into the industry because it's, it's, it's also important, you know, and uh, it's very fulfilling work. I mean, I took, I took a, I took a risk. I wouldn't say it's a risk, but you know, I took an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming off new, I met um, a lady by the name Christina from Gabon, and mm-hmm. he was just getting in, you know, and was really excited, but also, you know, overwhelmed by, you know, how do you run a production? She was doing everything. She's the director. Mm-hmm. She's the writer. She's the producer, and you know, I was like, okay, if you can get me to Gabon. I'll film this short film for you. It's a really amazing eight minute short that should be out soon. She's part of the new, um, she was part of the new producers lab. Mm. And um, she was like, I could just hear eyes light up, you know, and then, and that, that for me was amazing. And she, you know, she managed to hustle up um, free flights, um, obviously sponsored by Rwandair. All we had to do mm-hmm. is just post on social media. Mm-hmm. And even for me, I, I'd never been to West Africa, you know, to the West Coast of Africa before. And for me, it's amazing because then, you know, I mean, I've I've managed to, you know, get on a production with somebody who's just starting out, you know, and, you know, kind of offer my expertise. But also at the same time, I'm, I'm seeing this amazing place that I've only dreamt of, you know, that's mm. 80% rainforest. You can't even imagine what's the biodiversity that's in there. And, you know, it's opened, my, yeah. it's opened me up to you know, more, more, more of Africa and, 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 you know, I can say now, you know, I've been to West Africa, I've got some experience yeah. living in West Africa. Yeah. So lifting people up and, you know, do, uh, strengthening, especially in Africa, because it's not really, I wish, I wish most of the viewers came to Newf. If you didn't come to Newf, please make sure you come next year. It was yeah. one of the best, you know, festivals that I've been to. Um, also wild screen as well um <laughs> but yeah i mean on top of that yeah don't always just look up climb always also lift people who are just coming in um what else what else could i say i think that's my main parting shot love um, it i love it yeah. sometimes we just want to network up it's always good also to network this way because you yeah. also get to meet people at your level or people who mm-hmm. you can grow together yeah, awesome. try and make it a circle rather than a ladder. At New Fit, it felt mm. like it was one huge circle, and maybe it's because we had the drum circle, and it was just <laughs> felt like we were yeah. all interacting. Everyone yeah. had their labels, you know, shed off their labels, and we were just having a good time mm. and, you know, making memories. So, yeah. Amazing. Thanks so much, Manu. Um, and how about you, Trishala? Any communities you have on your end, um, as well as your parting short? Um, I think that... Social media is a massive uh, untapped, well, I guess it is tapped, but it's something that we don't think of immediately when we want to look for opportunities, but it's definitely worth a look. I mean, it starts off by you just following somebody um, that you admire the work of, or maybe they posted their show reel and you're interested in, in camera work, and then it goes from there. Um, so take take social media opportunities and try and use it for work, not for, <laughs> not just for <laughs> pulling, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, if you can get on to some kind of newsletter I, I, I was just trying to figure out how I got on to this but um, I'm, I have an entire grants table uh, International Documentary Association table I don't know how I got onto it honestly mm-hmm. I don't know when it happened. <laughs> but You've got to share that. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a calendar of all the different um grant opportunities and their deadlines and what they need from you in this beautiful spreadsheet format again i don't know how to how i got it but maybe just google um ida and see if that you could if you could get hold of something like that because then it'll give you exactly what's available when and you for those things you've got to just keep striking sometimes mm. i mean sometimes um grants have one liner opportunities you just put in a plot plot for one line throw it in there and you you just gotta try you gotta just keep giving it a go and I think that's my last sentiment would be just just go just try whether (laughs) it's going to uh to wild screen 
or or you know just asking maybe you do this shoot all of a sudden you've got flights paid for you you know it's mm -hmm. it's just a matter of asking um yeah Recently, I asked a company if I could have a microscope, and they said yes, and they sent me a microscope. What? It's, it's, <laughs> it's no, I want a microscope. It's, it's just as simple as asking, and the microscope is lovely. <laughs> but just ask, Manu. <laughs> just ask. Just ask. Um, because it's either you're going to have a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> Either you're going to be shot down or ignored, um, uh, and you might, your yeah. ego might be a little bit bruised, but mm. your ego is going to get bruised if you're in this industry anyway. So you might as well get practice. So just ask. <laughs> awesome. Great. Don't be scared, um, everyone. Trishala is just joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, this conversation has been so amazing. And I think we should definitely have a part two <laughs> where we have people come back to tell us um, if, if, if they want, uh, if they actually um, practice what you told them. But thank you so much for sharing your evening um, with us and sharing all this wisdom with us. Um, unfortunately, everybody, that's all we had time for today. We clip to Shala Manu again. A huge thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have all of you and a pleasure to be part of this conversation with you. Um, Wild Screen have had a whole month of Emerging Talent webinars, so make sure you catch up on any of this if you miss them on their Wild Screen Emerging Talent playlist on YouTube. 